Gwilym, hiya, how are you? I'm fantastic, Lee. First question, you know this is coming. How is Albert Treacle? We haven't talked about him and things have been happening. Th- things things have been happening. So, um, yeah, for anyone who's listening in for the first time, uh, we we have this ongoing story of my tortoise, Albert Treacle, which is, um, oh, you need to listen to an earlier podcast to, to find out the story of his name. That in, in and of itself is fascinating. I've got him hibernating, mate. It's been a, it's been a difficult job to get him hibernating because the weather's been up and down. And uh, he doesn't like being indoors because it's too warm for him and he doesn't slow down. He doesn't like being outdoors. It's slightly too cold for him. So he goes and tries to hibernate himself somewhere. So I've been doing this thing recently where I've been taking him in and out of the house. So take take him out during the day, put him in his outside house so he stays cool, bring him in of an evening. And I was bringing him in probably about two weeks ago now. And I got to our conservatory doors and the wind caught the conservatory door. The conservatory door caught my elbow. He flew out of my hands and he was plummeting head first towards the patio and I had a silly pair of flip-flops on. And the only thing I could think of doing was trying to get my foot underneath where he was going to land. I managed to do it brilliantly, but he landed kind of like shell down on my toe and broke my toe. So um, he was fine. He's just got a couple of little scratches on his shell. He was absolutely fine. But I've got, uh, yeah, I'm still recovering from a broken toe. I'm sorry to hear about your toe. That's probably one of the most exciting things that's ever happened to Albert Treacle. Yeah, no, yeah. But for him, it would have been like flying, wouldn't it? It would have been um, a surreal experience that he would, wouldn't, wouldn't have had before. It ties in with your look at the moment because that sounds like a rugby drop kick, and you are currently sporting a tash that makes you look like a slightly questionable 1970s rugby player. This is my Movember effort, mate. Please feel free to donate if you've not already done so. Obviously, obviously. Please feel free to shave it off on the 1st of December. <laughs> oh, no, no. 1st of December is Super Council Day, and I will be sporting this. <laughs> I may, in fact, dye it red or some such um, interesting colour just to brighten it up for everybody. Lee Davis and Gwilym Roberts are the two IPs in a pod, and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property, brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. Hey, should we crack on? We've got a really, really special episode today. Um, we're going to be talking about the Earthshot Prize. Do you know what that is, mate? I know a little bit, and I'm going to know a lot more soon. You are, yeah. So, so as far as I understand it, it's a uh, it's a prize that's been brought about to try and incentivize some change and help make the world a better place, to repair some of the horrible things that we humans have been doing to it over the certainly the most recent decades. It's really captured the interest of people around the world. I was absolutely glued to the TV recently when the inaugural prizes were given. I thought it was an absolutely brilliant piece of TV. I was entirely captivated by it, um, watching the first prize winners get their investments to help to sustain and grow the initiatives that that they've already started to bring about. The Earthshot Prize, you'll know this, was launched by the Royal Foundation of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, and Prince William's taken a real prominent leadership role in the initiative, and also he's got the backing of some really influential people. I'm sure we're going to find out who as we go through the podcast, but most notably at Sir David Attenborough, National Treasure. And there is no bigger challenge than securing the world we've inherited for those who come after us. And as I've um, as I've just got grandchild number five this week... Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's something that's really in the forefront of my mind at the moment, the horrible state we've let the world get into and how we might make it a better place for those who are coming after us. So it's brilliant, brilliant to have on the podcast, Rachel Moriarty, who's head of prize design and impact at the Royal Foundation, uh, and also Jerry Bridge Butler, chair of CEPA's Media and Public Relations Committee and partner at Baron Warren Redfern. Welcome to you both. Rachel, can you tell our listeners... We've, we learned out earlier today that we get about 1,500 regular listeners and then uh, an extended audience beyond that. So that's really, really good. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, Rachel? Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, so, yeah, my name's Rachel Moriarty. Um, I, as you mentioned, I'm the head of prize design and impact for the Earthshot Prize. Um, I've been working for the Royal Foundation for about four and a half years so it's uh, an agile charitable foundation based in London. And, and as you said, it's the primary charitable vehicle for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. So I've been involved very, very fortunately in the design and implementation of lots of innovative social and environmental change projects at the foundation. So including some of the Duchess's work on early years and obviously most recently the Earthshot Prize. So I've, I've led the, the design of the prize. So including the five Earthshots and the 
prize process um, and I head up the search and selection process. So the most exciting part, in my opinion, of the prize, which involves searching for potential nominees and then selecting the ultimate winners. So I'm really passionate about social and environmental work. Um, and so this has been a real dream come, come true for me working on such a... Haven't you, haven't you got one of the best jobs in the world? <laughs> I think so. I definitely think so. <laughs> how, how, how did you come to be there? What did you do before that? Like, so I've been working at the foundation for a while and I, I've been working on kind of new project designs. So that's really where my expertise is. And my background is, is in um, research, consumer insight and strategic planning. So I do a lot of listening to, to people, to what people think and how and looking at how they behave and then using that to create new uh, social or environmental projects. Um, I'm currently doing a master's at the University of Cambridge in social innovation as well, part time. Um, and so that sets me up very nicely for creating these new projects. And so I just I just really fell in love with the Earthshot Prize in particular. It's very, very close to my heart. And having been involved in it since the beginning in the design, it's it's something that I, I, you know, I've I've really become very attached to. So I'm really pleased that I now get to to lead the this really exciting part of the prize, which is obviously the the finding the winners. Oh well, thank thank you so much for joining us. And um, I've got lots of questions to ask you. And Gwilym, Gwilym might even say a word or two as we go along. You never know. Jerry, can you make yourself sound as interesting and exciting as Rachel? Uh, probably not, actually. <laughs> Yeah, well, my name is Jerry Bridge Butler. As you said, I'm a partner at Baron Warren Redfern, but I'm also the chairman of the CEPA Press and PR Committee, which I've done for about, oh, I don't know, eight or nine years or something. Man. And the reason I got into that is because before I was a patent attorney, I was a newspaper journalist. So that's how I got into doing that for CEPA. So on my committee, our job is to promote patent attorneys and the patent system to the public at large. And we do that in lots of different ways by publishing articles, staging events, that kind of thing, responding to journalists' questions, and also trying to get involved in things like the Earthshot Prize. So when that was announced and when we first heard about it, it just seemed like a really good idea to offer our assistance and to see if we could help out, mainly to, to assist and to see how we could help with the delivery of, of IP requirements as part of the process, but also, I guess, in a self-serving way to generate a little bit of publicity for ourselves, because that's what my job is at CEPA. Well, uh, th thank you. Thank you for all you do for CEPA. I know you do a huge amount. Uh, and also thank you for sparing your time to, um, to come on the podcast with us. Brilliant to have you here. So, Rachel, should we kick off with you? Is that OK? Because um, please do. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure most people listening will, will know of the Earthshot Prize. Um, hopefully they would have seen the, uh, the inaugural uh, event, the launch of it. But can you tell us a little bit about how it came into being and how it went from being a, a, a concept, whose idea it was, to the, the brilliant um, event that we saw recently? Yeah, so um, as some some people will probably have seen and know from the past, um, Prince William's been really involved in wildlife conservation for many years. Um, and the foundation have been doing work on things like illegal wildlife trade um, for quite a long time, too. And I think one of the things that that struck him and the team was that when we were visiting some of these projects that work on, on tackling illegal wildlife trade, we came across these, these really fantastic um, solutions to, to wider environmental challenges in all different parts of the world. So, you know, things that were, were focusing on, on, on supporting wildlife and biodiversity, but also were helping people at the same time or were, were you know, minimizing the effects of climate change at the same time. And we had this discussion that was kind of along the lines of, well, why haven't we heard of these things in the UK? Why aren't they, why aren't they big? Why aren't they kind of um, being put on a platform and, and championed and um, because actually some of this could be could be replicated where we live and presumably elsewhere as well and I think that was coupled with a bit of a realization that actually the narrative in the UK and, and some other places as well can be quite negative around climate change you know for good reason it's a really scary subject yeah. it, it's very much a, a crisis and an emergency but sometimes when you overemphasize those elements of it it can put people off being engaged because you know they they think this is terrifying what if it's a lost cause you know there's so much mistrust in in the people that that are making decisions on this and 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 people kind of think well how can how can i make a difference i'm just one person and we really wanted to change that that framing and that way of thinking to being more about you know, collective action and actually inspiring people to feel more optimistic that, you know, fantastic work is happening. We just need to focus on that as much, you know, that 
to give that a boost. Um, and so that was where the idea for doing a prize came from. It wasn't just to kind of pat people on the back for doing good work, although obviously we do want to do that, but it was really to, to incentivize action as well. So to be able to, to scale and amplify the work of people that are doing great things and also inspire other people around the world to, to do similar work. Well, that's a brilliant initiative. And I know it's captured the imagination of, um, of lots of people. Can I ask a really boring question? Where does the money come from? We have a number of, of founding partners that support us with the Earthshot Prize. So they're not just there to kind of to give money, um, and which which obviously goes into the prize fund, which goes to the prize winners and directly helps to scale the impact of their work. But they're also, you know, all passionate about the environment themselves so you know for example Bloomberg philanthropies have a long-standing history um, in environmental philanthropy and so they also give us their expertise you know and their their collaboration in in several different ways and um, so we're really fortunate to have that way of kind of bringing in the money but also um being able to work with some fantastic organizations in the process that's, that's amazing you, you said that um, part of your role is uh, is the process side of it f- finding nominees and um and also the decision process in terms of who gets the awards and for those who sadly don't how, how does all of that work how, how do you find the nominees and um and who decides who gets what well can i chuck in that and what are the criteria i was really interested in that kind of criteria point as well brilliant questions and um, love it when people ask about this kind of thing so <laughs> we we use a, a process that is is kind of similar and and inspired by the Nobel Prizes process, which involves a cohort of nominators. And they search for and submit nominations to us. And the reason that we we use this process is is for kind of two main reasons. It allows us to, to get real global reach and diversity. So we have more than 200 nominators who are based in all different parts of the world. And they have these wide networks into what's happening at a grassroots level. So what's happening on the ground, the latest kind of scientific and technology development um, and the latest kind of best practice in governments and businesses. And they submit the nominations to us. And so it means that we get this incredible breadth across the world that, you know, we, we could only dream of getting if we put out an open call for applications. And it means we get things um, coming into us that are both kind of inspiring, but actually really have a proven impact already. So we're looking at things that are um, not at a very, very early idea stage, but are at the stage where they can really be scaled or amplified or replicated, you know, and, and they're in the best possible position to, to do that and to benefit from, from the prize. And then they the nominations go through a screening process, which is run independently. Um, and, and obviously we kind of oversee the process, um, but they, they go through a number of different assessments. Um, so that includes obviously the work that Jerry and his team have done on, on looking at intellectual property and the kind of different needs. And I think there's this kind of dual need of, of, um, of, of screening and, and, and assessing the nominations for, to decide who should win, but also assessing what kind of support needs they have so that we can, we can support them in the best way once they are announced as, as a finalist. And the, the criteria that we look at are basically um, a really inspiring story that will bring people on board, make people feel part of the movement. Um, a, a inclusive um, benefit for humans. So not just not just prioritizing the planet, but also the humans that live on it, making sure that there's benefits. And you'll hopefully have seen this in some of our winners that they they don't just kind of um, they don't just you know repair certain parts of the planet. They actually you know provide jobs. They yeah, pro- yeah economic benefits and things like that yeah there was a real infrastructure aspect to it was, was what yes me. exactly we want things that are really a win-win for the for the planet and humans and then the the final criteria that we look at is that potential to scale um, and it doesn't necessarily mean just growing an organization it could mean um replicating the action elsewhere so one of our winners was the city of milan um, and we really want other cities to take what they've done and, and replicate that because that could be so powerful, you know, if, if every city around the world was was using the same kind of food waste policy that Milan are using. Oh, so that's what they did. They've got the food waste policy and that will what's put them on. Yes. So what, what's the prize? How does the prize fit in? Well, they have to they get the prize. What does Milan do with that prize? What are they going to do? 
Yeah, so they will use the, the prize money to, to scale their impact both within Milan, but also to be able to kind of blueprint what they've done and share that with other cities. So that other cities aren't just seeing this as an idea and thinking, how, how on earth are we going to do that? But they've actually got a kind of blueprint that they can use um, to replicate it. Um, and I think that, you know, that it's, it's not an easy thing to do at a citywide level. You know, there's lots of ways to, to redistribute food waste to people in need. But Milan are actually doing this kind of across the whole city where they're gathering waste food from restaurants, from supermarkets, from municipal buildings and, and distributing it to food banks. So they're working with, with partners at all levels. So actually getting another city to replicate that is is you know it's not without its complications but we think that by by kind of investing in Milan to be able to really share how they've done that it really shows that it can be done. And Milan pre presumably made a big fuss about it very excited and they're getting the word out through their response to it as well. <clears throat> yeah, exactly one of the big things of about the Earthshot Prize is really being able to give that profile and platform and and kind of sharing the the magical stories but also crucially sharing that you know this can be done and and that yeah, we've had some brilliant um, stories that, that we've heard from people saying, you know, I, I noticed the this water box that was developed in Japan, but actually I think this can apply where I live in Canada, for example. Um, and that's really what we want to do is to try and spark that global impact. Do you think that Lee's tortoise caring capabilities are something we could scale by virtue of the Earthshot Prize? I don't think my feet are big enough. <laughs> I think we could introduce a new sport of tortoise keepy uppy. <laughs> Jerry, I was I was just about to say let's um let's give Rachel a bit of a breather and um and let's hear a little bit from you. Do you fancy talking us through how SEPA came to be involved and what that involvement's looked like? Well, as I said before, um in my role as uh, trying to promote patent attorneys in the patent system, I'm always trying to think of opportunities to do that. Um, but at the same time, I'm also struck by what Rachel said earlier, and I'm sure we all feel the same way, which is what on earth can I do to help? What can one person do? Yeah. And we've been thinking for so long about this and thinking, oh, well, I could you know, get an electric car or something. It's like, you know, what can I really do? And you think about what it is we do in intellectual property. We're right at the heart of human ingenuity and human innovative efforts. You know, it's happening all around us. And some of, some of the listeners will be fortunate enough to have clients who really are at the cutting edge of environmental technology, um, I have some clients who are doing that um, in their manufacturing and in the way that they uh, design and sell products and recycle them and that sort of thing. And you can see it happening everywhere. So you try to help them, but it's basically them that is doing it. And we're, we're facilitating some of the IP protection associated with that. Um, but when I saw the Airsoft Prize being announced, I immediately thought to myself, yes, that's the kind of thing that, that I really want to see happen. I've been thinking for some time, we need to have more of this sort of thing, get it into people's minds. And it's been so gratifying to see how well it's been done. And as you said, the TV coverage was brilliant, all, all, the, all the sort of little segments in, in the programme and all the books and all the publicity and everything. It's exactly what's needed to get everyone thinking in a positive light about, about the environmental crisis. As you say, most of the time we're all just scared of it. But this is, this is such a positive way of looking at it and saying to ourselves, we're humans, we are ingenious we can do these things you know there's a big debate going on at the moment about whether we should all go forwards with innovation to solve the environmental crisis or go backwards by regressing and doing less of things and it's obviously a question of doing both you know we need to use fewer uh, fossil fuels but we also do need to do all this innovation i have a lot of hope that we will be able to do that because i've seen it i, I work with the inventors every day i work with innovative companies so as all the listeners do so it's very easy from a patent attorney's perspective to say, yeah, we, we can do this, but the wider world doesn't necessarily know anything about it. So when it was announced, when the Earthshot Prize sort of hit the news, I just thought to myself, well, what can I do? What can we do? What can we do to help? Um, and I'm sure some of the listeners like myself might have previously been involved with uh, innovation competitions. Um, I've done pro bono work for some competitions where you help out the entrance by, you know, filing a patent application on the day of the ceremony and stuff like that. Um, you know, the sort of requirements that come up. But the thing that would really be horrifying for something like the Earthshot Prize would be if they gave a prize to somebody with great fanfare and then it transpired a week later that someone else had the patents for this or that there was some sort of major problem. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at the entrance for a competition like this, you really need to do some really basic due diligence on them. Um, and you also can provide a lot of pro bono assistance from an IP perspective. 
So I just thought, well, why don't we just contact the Royal Foundation, just ask them, you know, what are you doing on an IP front? Can we help? We've got a vast resource of people. Um, you know, would, would you like some assistance? And it was um, very gratifying that very quickly we got a response from Rachel saying, yes, you know, let's have a chat. Let's see what you can come up with. So we had sort of basic conversations earlier on this year about us talking about some of the things that they ought to be aware of. Um, and then the Royal Foundation said, well, yeah, why, why don't you help us with these things? Because as I understood it, I think there was a lot of screening going on, but it was at a different level. It didn't really necessarily involve intellectual property as such. Um, so we just sort of tagged that on. Um, and we did it by using the resources of the committee, which if people don't know, a lot of the members of my committee are actually the um, marketing managers of the bigger firms. So we have attorneys on the group, but mostly it's made up of marketing managers these days who have a fantastic reach. So we can reach out to them and say, we need some people to volunteer to help with this. And within about 24 hours, I had 30 people um, from across the board, from bigger firms who put people forward and also, because we, we send a sort of email out to a group of about 30 people who say that they do marketing, it sort of penetrates down into the profession. So we got together a team of about, in the end, it was about 25 people, something like that, and it grew as we went along. The wall felt the same way. They just immediately came forward and said, you know, can I help? I want to help. Um, and they all had the same kind of attitude as I did. You know, what can we do? What can we do to help? So what did we actually do? Well, uh, the first thing we did was come up with a questionnaire that the entrants had to answer. And the point of it was to elicit enough information out of them for us to make some kind of assessment as to their intellectual property situation. Um, and it was because uh, we were doing this for the first time. It was an interesting iterative process with Rachel and her colleagues. Um, and it transpired that it needed to be done uh, with an online sequence of questions. So you have a question tree, you know, where, where someone will answer questions and they will be directed to different questions. So that was um, quite fun to get involved in, but quite frustrating. And we sort of, you know, eventually ended up with something that would work. And I had a small group of attorneys help me with that. And we we're asking ourselves, well, what questions are we going to ask these people? Because one of the things that's really interesting about Earthshot, the things that really is different about it, is that it's not actually just about inventions. Inventions are just a very narrow part of it. So as attorneys, patent attorneys, we come into this and go, well, we need to talk about inventions. But really it's this word ingenuity, which I think is a really interesting word because it's a broader word than innovation or invention. It's a much broader word. And that's why you have entrants like you know, cities, you know, political policies, political campaigns, um, organizations that you know, don't really own any IP, but are just doing really good things. So it's actually a really quest interesting question. What, intellectual property questions should you be asking people <laughs> because some of them may be completely irrelevant some of them may be relevant or whatever but anyway we did that uh, and submitted that on time and then very quickly because the, this whole thing was moving very fast uh the end i think it was about a hundred entries so it was the long list i guess um answered these questions and it was all part of a much longer sequence of questions they were being asked about all sorts of other things um and we were delivered all these uh answers in an incredibly dense and impenetrable spreadsheet. Thank you for that, Richard. Um, so I had, to, <laughs> I had to get some help with my spreadsheet skills because they're not very good to try to sort of move it all around and put it into columns so that you could sort of see the questions and see the answers. And we broke it all up um, and divvied it out to all the volunteers. So they were each given, I think, three entries to look at. And this is where just where it got really fascinating because I was looking at all this information, which was all confidential at the time. So, I, you know, it was all under NDA, but I could see it all. I could see who all the entrants were. I could see all the answers they were giving. I could see what it was all about. It was just fascinating. And I, but I sort of divvied it up just on a kind of first come, first serve basis and sent it all out to the attorneys who, bless them, in really rapid um, time, came back with uh, their assessments. So we tried to do a very basic kind of traffic light response, green this entrant has no intellectual property issues. Amber, there are some potential issues here. This is what they are. This is what needs to be done. And red, there's a serious problem here. Um, this entrant isn't really fit to continue. Fortunately, there weren't any red graded entrants, which was really good because obviously uh, you know, they're all pretty high quality, but there were quite a lot. I would say about half of them were rated amber by the attorneys who would then say, well, this person is using a brand, but they haven't registered it. Or this person, you know, they're talking about inventions and further inventions, innovation in the future. They haven't got any patents or anything like that or whatever. But there were also things like, you know, are, were they licensing the IP and who they're, who they're working with and all this kind of stuff. So we, we gave all that back to the Royal Foundation and it got absorbed into their assessment 
process and the sort of I, I don't know I'm interested to hear from Rachel I guess well, that, 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 that was going to be my that was going to be yeah. my next question I was, <laughs> was going to come to Rachel and ask her how useful was all of that yeah it was uh, well it was really useful for two reasons because it I mean fortunately we didn't have any real red flags where we have to say you know this this nominee just needs to be removed outright so but we did have some some of these amber flags and and the reason that was useful is because we could consider that then as part of the assessment process so this was when we were I think this was when we were going from 60 to 30 nominees is that right Jerry? I don't know I, should I know. know you were you did narrow down chunk by chunk didn't you? Yeah, I should know this, but I think it was, yeah, it was when we were going from kind of 60 to 30. So it wasn't right at the end when we were deciding the finalists, but we wanted to be confident that, um, that we weren't going to have any of these major, major issues. Um, and so it brought a lot of confidence in that sense that there wasn't anything really awful that we needed to address and kind of gave some, some confidence in, in the process so far as well. Um, but it meant that we could consider any of these amber flags as, as part of the selection process and say, you know, is this something that's actually quite substantive and, and, and really is going to take them some time to work out and, you know, they might be better off being nominated in the following year? Or actually, is it something that we could just work with them on as part of the kind of support that we give? So particularly for our, you know, if, if you win the prize, obviously you get a million pounds to help scale your work. You get a, a one of a kind um, kind of trophy as well. Um, but if you're everyone else that's a finalist really gets treated the same apart from that. So, so we give bespoke support to all 15 of our finalists. And um, and we really the 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 information that Jerry and his team provided was so useful because it, it helped to give us an idea of what kind of support they needed. So, you know, if it wasn't a deal breaker, we still think what they're doing is amazing and worth, um, you know, amplifying, worth giving a boost to scale. It helped us to understand kind of, well, what are the, the some of the barriers that are in their way that actually we need to help them overcome? And we were you know, extra lucky that, that then Jerry and his team kind of um, offered to help with some of that support. So, you know, help to, if we if we connect some of our um, nominees with them, you know, some of them already had IP attorneys, but particularly for those that didn't, this was really helpful. And actually, even for, for those that did, it's helpful for them, for them to have like a bit of second opinion advice as well. And um, particularly if they're not from the UK and they're thinking about um, thinking about scaling some of their work in, in the UK and other markets. And um, so it was really helpful for, for both the kind of the selection purposes, but also I think even more so in that value for how how we support um, our nominees. That's amazing. I'm, I'm so pleased that works so well. Gwilym, are you coming in? Well, yeah, I was so going to say the, the example, the Milan example is kind of a food strategy, food waste strategy example. Do you see kind of serious technology contenders possibly being winners as well? Is that, not, is that a possibility? Yeah, so we we actually had um, we had a, a few technology based finalists, well, actually several that were were technology based, and one in particular that won in the clean our air category um, was Takachar, which is this technology based in India, and it's just absolutely fantastic. They they use um, they they developed a technology that turns agricultural and crop residue waste into um, kind of high value products like fertilizers for farmers, because one of the, the big contributors to air pollution in, in areas particularly like Delhi in India is, is agricultural crop burning. So at the end of, a, end of a day, a farmer will burn their kind of crop waste because it's easier, it's cheaper than, than transporting, it to, transporting it to a waste disposal site. But it contributes hugely to, to urban air pollution in the sort of neighboring cities. So Takachar developed this technology that, that fixes to the back of a tractor. So it's portable. The farmers can actually use it on site um, and it turns that waste residue into, into these products that they can either use themselves like fertilizer or they can sell them. So it actually add, increases their income. So it's, it's that kind of win-win element. Again, it helps the farmers, it helps the, the humans living in the cities, and it also decreases the, the kind of the carbon impact and the air pollution. Um, so that we, we saw lots of kind of really ingenious examples like that, where people are innovating to solve multiple problems with technology. And I think 
although that's it, it, you know, it's not a technology prize solely, we're always going to be awarding different types of action. I think technology is is all is going to be such an important part, you know, for the whole time that we're doing the prize. So Jerry, presumably the IP angle on something like that is really, really significant. Sorry, what was your question? Didn't hear that. Oh, uh, the, the IP angle on something like that is going to be definitely worth delving into in some depth. Yeah, I should think so. Um, I think it's worth me just talking about some of the, the work that we did connecting attorneys to the winners, because I haven't actually reported mm. this back to Rachel, even though she asked me to about two months ago. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I will do this. I will let me explain. Um, but yes, so there were 15 finalists and they were uh, asked whether they wanted to be connected to an attorney. And those that did ask uh, were connected to um, the attorney that had originally assessed them. So it was done on that basis. Um, and for the, you know, I, I would just say to the attorneys, you know, just do whatever you would like to do, Is it kind of pro bono clinic or, you know, however you want to assess it, help them out how you, you want to assess them. Um, and I, I, I did go out to them and say, you know, uh, what success did you have? You know, who do you speak to? What happened? And I did get some really good feedback. Um, from some of them. So there, there definitely were some instances where the finalists, I don't know whether they're winners or not, did connect with a, an attorney and have a really good consultation. Like Rachel said, some of them already had attorneys. Um, some of them simply didn't need it. Um, but it was really uh, good that we could provide that as, as something that could be offered. And it was taken up on a number of instances. Um, so, you know, if you have something like what's just been described, um, that's a really interesting piece of technology. And if you're looking to scale it up, then you know, a million uh, pound prize is incredibly helpful in doing that. But also you're going to need to think about your intellectual property, protecting it in the jurisdictions that you're going to go into so that you can control that and grow that business um, and offer licenses or, or whatever it's going to be and guarantee a return from the investment that you're putting in. That's what intellectual property is obviously for. Um, so I, I don't think uh, this time around there were, ever, there were any sort of mega bits of technology which you know a, a super attorney was connected with and has resulted in massive international patent filings but that's obviously something that could potentially happen in the future and i think the whole point is to provide that as an option and to provide that support and as i think as rachel has intimated it was provided as part of a suite of different things so the finalists got support from all kinds of different angles so it was just bundled in with that um which is must be really great from from the finalists or winners perspective you're not just being given money and being told to go off or go off and be successful with that it's like, here's some money and here's some support to get you going um, and to make this a reality, because that's surely the whole point, as Rachel said at the beginning. It's not just about patting people on the back. Um, it's about actually affecting change. And that's what's so brilliant about this prize and the way it's been designed um, and, and the sort of candidates that were put forward and the kind of people who actually won. You know, you, you listen to Rachel talking about, you know, what they're doing in Milan. And it just seems like a no-brainer. Why isn't every city doing it? But there's all these kind of barriers in place. You know, we all know what bureaucracy is like. Um, and just that money and the, the publicity and the exposure that it's given will surely mean that, that that process and those systems will be spread out. And that will have a meaningful, real, genuine impact. And we can all be traced back to people like Rachel uh, coming up with this, these ideas and bringing them to fruition. Rachel, can we, um, can we come back to the, the prize itself? So um, one of the questions that was going through my mind getting, getting ready for today is it, it was a brilliant piece of TV. We've already talked about that. And next year, there'll be another brilliant piece of TV with another fantastic range of um, nominees and, and prize winners. What happens in between the two big events? What, um, how do you carry on telling the story of the, um, of the winners and the nominees? And what other work does the, does the foundation do to, um, to promote the initiative between just two great pieces of TV? Uh, it's a really good question. And I think we we definitely, there's definitely benefits having those really big moments in the calendar, but we don't want to go completely silent in between them, especially because once we, we reopen our nominations again in January, there's a lot that's happening behind the scenes and there's a lot that that we don't want to talk about, you know, we keep it a secret until we we announce our, our finalists. So so you don't know who the who the winners of next year are going to be until slightly later. So I think in that time it is really important for us to tell the stories of of the winners and finalists from this year. One thing we're really keen on is that 
they don't just they don't just kind of win the money have a big a big splash and then disappear we want this to be a really long term impact on them and 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 you know on people's general awareness of what they're doing so i think over you know the coming months until we we announce the next finalist we want to be telling that story so what have the winners done since they since they won what are they using their prize money for what's the kind of impact that they've seen as a result and the same for for all the finalists like we've said so what kind of how have some of our partners helped the finalists to scale and not only does that kind of tell their story but it's it's also really important for actually for the future nominees of the prize you know people if you're an environmental innovator or you're kind of uh, you're an activist that wants to be nominated you can really see how that journey it's not just it's not just about winning on stage at, in that particular moment. It's actually a, a long term impact that will help you um, to scale the work that you're doing. So so that storytelling is, is really important for us. And I think it's something at the foundation that we do really well. And it's partly because we, we have this incredible platform, you know, and um, we have Prince William and a whole host of, of other high profile names involved in the prize. And they really help to to amplify the work of, of the, the finalists in, in different parts of the world. So, so yeah, we while we're kind of doing things in the background and, and selecting our future winners, we want to kind of keep that story alive. Fantastic. That's really great to know, and I'll, um, I'll certainly look out for that. The, the other thing that, um, that I was thinking about, I um, don't know why I was thinking about this, but um, it struck me, and it was only really when I was thinking back early on today to, to watching it on TV, I wasn't... I didn't know what to expect, but I didn't expect it to be as international as it was. So it was uh, one. I, I was I, I was perhaps thinking it was going to be a little bit more closer to home. It was already really international. So, and I've learned today that that international dimension is really really important. Surely there is still a need though to grow and increase that international reach. Where, where do you have target areas? How do you how do you intend to grow and increase the reach of the program? That's that's a brilliant point because we're we're always going to have um, stronger reach in certain parts of the world just naturally based on on kind of where where people have have heard of the Earthshot Prize already you know they're already familiar with the work that Prince William has been doing in the environmental space and um, and we definitely want that to expand and it's it's super important because although a, a lot of the impacts of climate change are felt in different ways in different parts of the world. We know that it's a global problem and we know that the kind of the the parts of the world that cause bits of the problem aren't necessarily the ones that will feel the impact. So it has to, you know, we have to be able to show the leadership that's have, happening all over the world to help combat, you know, both the impacts and also the cause of those impacts. So, you know, we're, we're constantly looking at the, the areas that we want to focus on in our in our first year we really focused on big air target areas in different parts of the world so the uk and the us we kind of already have a relatively strong influence but we wanted to really focus on places like india and um, particularly because we know it's, it's somewhere where air pollution is a big issue and also other parts um, of asia looking at the middle east where air pollution is a big concern and um, and then looking at, at countries like brazil and other countries in latin america where you know there are slightly different issues that are at the forefront of people's minds. So, so looking more at kind of nature and deforestation and how much of an issue that is there. So I think we we try and take the approach that it's it's not a one size fits all. We don't want to kind of assume that everyone's experiencing um, these environmental issues in the same way or that, that you know the same things are a concern. But we want to kind of make sure that we we have different things to engage people. You sure. know. Being the clean our air earth shot one of the main reasons for that was because we knew that huge parts of the world have such big problems with air pollution and actually it's not always seen as as being as important as, as some of the other um environmental issues so we really wanted to call that out so that we would have that kind of appeal in in those parts of the world lee thinks i'm going to ask a silly question but i'm not lee ha huh. I'm, I'm dreading um, this one but i know it's coming no, 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 it's, it's not. This is a sensible question, actually. It's for Rachel again. Sorry, Joe, I got, I've got one for Jerry as well, actually. But um, Which is that you've got lots of support and con contributors and donors, and you mentioned about how people can donate expertise and all that kind of thing, and, and CEPA's obviously delighted to have done that. Some people are doing it for good ethics. They just think it's the right thing to do. 
Some people probably are doing it because it fits with what the firm needs to say about the co-corporate social responsibility. And I guess the essence of philanthropy and whether you should be doing it for a reason or whether you should just do it because it's the right thing to do. Does Earthshot mind <laughs> why people are helping? Um, I guess what's important for us is that the people that we work with have a demonstrable commitment to the environment. So we don't want to kind of support anybody's greenwashing activities. We want to make sure that the people we're working with share our vision and gen are genuinely committed to it. So they've taken genuine steps. If it's if it's a business, they're already taking steps in their business to, to show that commitment. Um, I think, you know, if, if people get a benefit from, from being involved in this kind of work, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, we want as many people to be involved um, in the movement as possible and, and, and people do it for different reasons. But I think what's important is that being part of the Earthshot Prize and being part of environmental movements um, more broadly isn't a way of covering up kind of poor practices or isn't a way of covering up the fact that you know many of us are part of the problem it's 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 acknowledging kind of acknowledging a real commitment to to changing certain things so i think yeah we we just re we we have a very rigorous due diligence process that underpins all of this um but i think at the heart of that is just this real desire to work with people who are in it because they they care and are in it are genuinely committed are genuinely committed to giving more than just money who are, are committed to giving time because they care about the mission that's actually a really helpful answer thank you i think some this is completely irrelevant to this podcast i'm fascinated by the concept of philanthropy generally and i think some people possibly don't do philanthropy because they think people might think their motives are not what they are or something so that's a great answer i'll stick with it and if i can just um jerry i was going to ask you obviously you, you reached out super reached out to the attorney profession last year um we have as, as lee says we have a fanatic listenership but, um you know, we've got a lot of people who 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 listen and who follow what Siva does generally. Any any messages to attorneys out there who might want to get involved? What can they do? Oh, I see. Well, hopefully we shall do the same thing again next year and the year after that, and carry on doing it, um, and and ride along with the with the organisers as the as the um, prize grows. So I'm not entirely sure of the timing, but I think at the beginning of next year um, the process will start up again, um, and we're going to need volunteers to, to do all the work uh, that I described earlier. Um, the more of us they are, the easier it is, really, because there's different things that we can do. And as I said before, I broke off into little teams to do different things. Um, we had all these entrants to do the diligence on, and we had the, the pro bono work to do. So if anybody wants to get involved, they can just um, email Neil at SEPA, who I don't, I don't know what his email address is. It's, it's he, Neil at SEPA. Neil enough. at SEPA, there you go, brilliant. I just offer their assistance. And then we can, we, we, I basically just have a, a big mailing list, and I can just add people to mailing lists. In fact, people joined up as we went along. At an initial sort of cohort of people, and then as, as time went past, you know, a few more people just joined up, which was in fact really helpful uh, for the simple reason that when it came to some of the crunch things we had to do, some people weren't available. And so I had this really good subs bench, and I just rolled people off the subs bench to help me out. And, and the ones who did were in fact really, really good. And that, that was a really helpful thing to have. So the more people we have available, the better. And in fact, you know, as I said, we divided up the entrance, so it was three apiece. So we could, you know, we could easily do one of these, you know, and just make life easier for everybody. Um, so if anybody wants to get involved, um, then to just email Neil. But the other thing that is worth bringing up, and I don't know if you were going to ask about this anyway, is that as a result of our involvement in the Earthshot Prize, the Royal Foundation has asked SEPA to become one of the nominator organisations uh, that Rachel mentioned earlier, which is incredibly exciting because it will allow us to put forward some nominations for next year's prize. And we intend to do that by asking member firms to put forward suggestions according to the kind of uh, rationale that Rachel was talking about earlier. We're looking for certain sorts of things. This is not an invention prize. This, this, what we're looking for is uh, clients that the membership has who could really benefit from this sort of assistance, this kind of money, this kind of support in other areas to scale something fantastic up. Um, and our membership, you know, collectively, thousands of attorneys, hundreds of thousands of clients, you know, the reach that we have is just massive. And we can reach down into you know, all the innovative activity that we get involved in that's starting out in the UK or is going through UK attorneys, the European Patent Office or whatever. But my experience of asking the, the members of my committee to come up with uh, examples of things where we need an example of a particular kind of invention or a particular kind of a story for a journalist to write about 
Um, and these things sort of vary from time to time. So we might need somebody who's in clothing. We might need someone who's in a detergents or, or, or chemicals or whatever. You reach out and you just get loads of people coming forward in 24 hours saying, we've got a client who does this. We've got a client who does that. They're happy to talk to you. Um, so we already have quite a lot of momentum with that sort of thing. So I'm really looking forward to that aspect of it next year. And I think it's been really exciting to see if we can put forward a few really, really good nominees um, to, so we can uh, help them. Uh, but also if, if we think that some of them might actually have that real lasting impact, that's what this is actually all about. Uh, it's all of us actually doing something that might actually lead to some change and might lead to things helping. As I understand it, the, the ceremony next year is going to be in America. Is that right, uh, Rachel? Yeah. So that also gives us an opportunity to reach out to our colleagues across the pond and maybe even ask them and say, look, we're involved in this. Um, we're looking for people who fit this quite narrow definition. Um, you know, do, you, do you have any candidates that you'd like to put forward so we can assess them and, and put them forward as part of our nomination? So that aspect of it, I don't know how that's actually going to work, the, being a nominator, <laughs> how many volunteers we might need, or uh, there's obviously going to have to be some pretty um, rigorous assessment. You know, who knows how many candidates might get put forward by member firms? Um, hopefully lots, but if there are lots, then we're going to have to spend quite a lot of time working through them and coming up with the right ones to put forward that fit the bill. Um, so we're going to need some assistance with that, maybe um, some more robust teams or, you know, however that's actually going to work. So that's all incredibly exciting. I'm looking forward to asking Rachel, in fact, how other people do it. <laughs> um, you know, how does the WWF do it and all this kind of stuff? You know, how are they actually doing it? Um, and do they have, you know, any guidance as to what would be best? And also, obviously, we don't want to inundate, inundate them with too many entries of the wrong type. But, you know, because we all know each other and because we're here in the UK, it's pretty simple to, to just start talking about that kind of thing. Well, Rachel, Gwillem didn't ask the question that I thought he was going to ask. So I, I, I might ask it for him because I know he's, he's desperate to know. I know he's desperate. It's really know. silly. Really <laughs> silly. So you do it. So, yeah. so, so Gwillem's quite obsessed with famous people and in, you know, well-known people and all these kinds of things. I'm not, this isn't a personal question. I don't want a personal reply from you at all. But I am conscious that your job's quite a challenging one in that you've got a host of high-profile, well-known people who have got other things just going on. Just go with it and ask the question. Come on, we know what you want. Just go on with it. <laughs> Lee, well, lots, mean, of, lots of other things asking. going on in their lives. And I'm embarrassed for so, asking, Lee. Rachel, we need to know. So so, so you're, you're herding these influential cats, if you like. What's it like working with people like Prince William and Sir David Attenborough? Go on, tell us. Um, to be honest, I can only really speak slightly from personal experience, but it's 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 just wonderful working with people that feel so passionately. I mean, we're we're obviously incredibly lucky to have Spurks people that not only care about the the issues, but who have a real a real platform and and can actually influence change at a real kind of global level. So we're we're very lucky for all the time that we do get. Obviously, working with lots of high profile people, um, we have to be very careful about what we what we ask them to do. We don't want to kind of inundate them with requests. We want to make sure that when when we um, ask them to do things, it's stuff that has a real tangible impact. So, for example, asking Shakira to be part of our documentary series had such a huge impact on the amount of people that were therefore able to watch that series and be inspired by it. And so we just make sure that, you know, when we're asking them to do things, um, it's where there's the most impact is, is possible. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're incredibly lucky. Everybody that we've we've engaged to work with, um, work on the prize has has been you know given their time freely and willingly because I think because they believe in it and um, they you know they're, they're so passionate about about the finalists we we were able to um to conduct kind of phone calls between different prize council members and the finalists which was just wonderful to see so they've just been incredibly generous with their time um and their voices so yeah we're just super grateful for that and hope it will continue Brilliant, brilliant answer. Thank you very happy much. Happy now, Lee. Happy now. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. Are you happy? Rachel, Jerry, thank you so much uh, for sparing your time to be on the podcast with us. Rachel, the work that you do, um, I want to say it's important, but important doesn't even seem to be a big enough word. So, so thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. It's, um, yeah, it's absolutely brilliant what you do. Jerry, thanks so much for... Um, channeling all of SEPA's efforts around this. Um, I've learned a huge amount. Uh, obviously, I've, I've been briefed on what we've been doing. I've learned so much uh, in the hour or so we've been talking. Thank you for sharing that with us. 
Gwilym, I will see you on the next podcast, mate, which I believe we might be recording in real life again and maybe even in a pub. Oh, really? Yeah. All right, then. Thanks all. Thanks all.